Our next question is from Mitchell in Bryant. And Mitchell writes, I've been investing and saving for over 26 years. I'm 58, and I'm thankfully confident that I can retire comfortably, but I've never really given much thought to what happens with the leftover when I'm gone. How should I work that into my overall plan? Great question from Mitchell. You know, people think, John, of... of uh, I, first of all, not too many people think they are comfortably ready for retirement. And, right. I, and I would probably ask Mitchell to make sure he has a very detailed retirement income plan written on paper on purpose that Absolutely. shows him his monthly income and make sure raises are included in that because you can't have a flat income for your entire retirement. How is it going to work? So what what is he basing his comfortability on? I hope it's a written plan. Yeah, so there's that issue. Now let's talk about this leftover issue because leftovers are good. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm not a big leftover fan. My wife will tell you that I, I try to avoid them if at all possible. But leftovers in terms of retirement are good. But I think the question uh, comes, Mitchell didn't say this, but if Mitchell is married, uh, very likely a couple's resources are going to need to cover both couple's resources resources are going to need to cover two lives. And very often we see one spouse being kind of the leader in the retirement area. They've made more money, they've saved more money and that type of thing. Uh, And so you've got to think if you're married, you've got to stretch this money, not over just your life, but uh, probably your spouse's life. Scott, I, I think a mistake that people make when it comes to this whole issue of retirement is they think very insular, very just, they think, think compartmentalized, just this is my retirement, this is her retirement. No, really, it's your retirement, the two of you together, because Social Security, even though it's based on individuals, they work together, and there could be a spousal benefit component uh, to Social Security. Oftentimes, the breadwinner, the biggest breadwinner in the family has the most in 401k savings and IRA savings and things of that nature. So I think you've got to think about that and understand what is this money going to ultimately be responsible for. Now, obviously, if it's responsible for a spouse, that's a more immediate need than if you want to pass it on to your family. But if you pass it on to your family, Scott, I think that you've got to think about the impact of the SECURE Act, which we've talked about on this show before, Mm, and how that literally is going to change the face of how retirement accounts are being handled by what we will call non-spouse beneficiaries like children and grandchildren. That SECURE Act, and there's been two of them now, and in fact, on our Fastest 4 Minutes in Finance, we're talking about some new provisions on SECURE 2.0, but the first SECURE Act changed the way inherited IRAs have to be withdrawn. So let's kind of walk through this, and and we're going to assume for just a minute that Mitchell is married. So, and we're going to assume that most of his retirement is in an IRA. So let's say if Mitchell has a million dollars in his IRA and he begins to withdraw off that, he's retired comfortably, he passes away and there's $500,000 left uh, in that IRA. If it, if he, if his spouse is still living, really nothing changes for her. It, right. it, it transfers into her name She, depending on her age, would possibly still have to take small portions out of it in what's called a required minimum distribution. At her passing, though, when it goes to the next generation, and the SECURE Act defines the next generation as 10 years or more younger than the owner of the IRA, so it could actually be a younger sibling, right, if you pass the, the, the funds on that way, but typically it's going to be the next generation then the rules are, let's say if $500,000 came to the son of those two uh, now deceased parents, that son would have to withdraw those funds completely over a 10-year period. At the end of that 10 years, it has to be all withdrawn. So think about the tax implications of that. If that is being stacked on top of someone and uh, someone's higher earning years, right, it's likely going to be taxed much higher than if it was withdrawn over a longer period of time. And I actually had this happen. Uh, we had uh, a gentleman come into our office not that long ago. He has an 82 year old father who received a spousal IRA from his deceased wife. And there's a there's two million dollars in this IRA, and the person that came in to see us is the sole heir of that two million dollars. And his dad is 82 and not in great health. When and if he passes away, if there's two million dollars in that IRA, that son is going to receive all of it and have to take it out over 
10 years, and if he makes $150,000, $160,000 already, and he's single too, by the way, so that, that means he's in a higher tax bracket already because he's not married, that's all going to pile in one of the highest tax brackets he could possibly imagine. He has a huge tax problem, and he recognized that. That's why he was coming in to see us. Yeah, and there's some things that, that can be done in that regard, yep. so I think that that's a, a real good path to go on. But I think that also if you go back to the question about what to do with the leftovers, I, if you're not single— and you've got this situation, then I think it's even more critical that you have a retirement income plan that allows you to maximize the income from your assets. If you don't have any particular need to leave money behind to someone, then don't. Uh, have a way of utilizing as much of that money as you possibly can. Now, what you don't want to do, and here's the balancing act, Scott, you don't want to run out of money before you run out of time because that's going to be a real problem. Mm -hmm. So you have to carefully craft a retirement income plan with an advisor to be sure that you've got all those bases covered. And I think that that one of the things that I would say that that you could fall into in a case like this is living that just in case retirement, right. where you've got this money and you're going to take some out and you, uh, I don't know if I need to spend that just in case something happens, just in case I live a lot longer than I thought I would, just in case I need to go to the nursing home. There are ways to craft this where you can maximize the amount of retirement income that you can get and still cover that longevity base. Yeah, when you have a written retirement income plan that shows you what you can take out and it's based on some conservative rates of return over a long period of time, it gives you the freedom to spend, right? You have yep. the ability to do that. And you can even maybe maybe even begin to take more out than you thought you could. And there are options to get that out of the IRA uh, so that it's not passed on and you're giving your kids a huge tax problem. And if that's a concern of you, just a couple of things that we can, we can throw out there. Uh, ahead of time, there could be some Roth conversions made, right? So the Roth IRA as we already talked about in this show, is completely tax-free when it's withdrawn. Now, it is subject to the SECURE Act provisions. In other words, it still has to come out in 10 years. But if it's in a tax-free account, there's no taxable impact of that right. for uh, the heir to pull that out. Now, you have to be careful about doing that. It's going to be hard to get the whole thing in there because – Obviously, you're going to have to pay the taxes on it in the year that you convert it, whatever amount you do. Right. And I would say also, uh, probably uh, in a situation where somebody's trying to maximize the tax benefit to their non-spouse beneficiary, is they might look at life insurance mm -hmm. to, to provide the money and spend the IRA. That way, you know that there is a, a substantial amount of money going to go tax-free to the heirs, and you don't have to worry about what happens with that traditional IRA account. One final thought on that before we move on to the next question. Another thing, when it comes to taxation, when it comes to uh, not really, uh, when you're worried about the leftovers, if you really think there's going to be a large sum at the end, there is something called a QCD, uh, a qualified charitable distribution. So if you're taking an RMD, uh, if you're of age, and really, actually, you can be pre-RMD age now because the QCD can be done at 70 and a half. So if at 70 and a half, you can actually send money out of your IRA directly to a qualified charitable institution, and that money is not taxed. Now, now you're not going to get to spend it, but you're also not going to have to pay taxes. Yeah, and, and uh, that is a qualified charitable uh, distribution that goes to that institution, and you can give up to $100,000 yeah. each year right. in that regard. That's a huge, huge benefit it if is. you really are thinking uh, in, from a charitable mindset. 